Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, Episode 10, I Cannot Wait. Before we get started, I'd like to make a minor correction to Episode 8. In that episode, I mentioned that the election of Pope Clement VII occurred in Avignon. The election actually took place in the Italian city of Anagni, a city which had its own long and storied connection to the papacy. Clement did move to Avignon soon after he was elected. Now, on with the show. Today we finally arrived at the launching point of Valois Burgundy. In 1384, Philip the Bold had been Duke of Burgundy for a little over two decades, but his rise to becoming Count of Flanders, Artois, Burgundy, Nevers, and Rethel marks the beginning of Valois Burgundy as a new polity. But Philip was not only involved in his domains. In 1384, he was also the de facto head of the Regency Council of King Charles VI, making him the most powerful man in the central government. There was so much on Philip's plate, and a lesser man may have let the opportunities in front of him slip away, overwhelmed by his responsibilities. But Philip, like all great leaders throughout time, was inexhaustible. His personal motto was Mult me tard, or Il me tard, which can be translated along the lines of Many await me, or I cannot wait. And that sure was true of Philip. His responsibilities pulled him all across France, and he was constantly on the move, darting from one thing that demanded his attention to another. He was always in a hurry, and could cover distances with enormous speeds, riding for ten or more hours in a day at times. There was even an account in the royal ledgers dedicated to paying for the horses that Philip had worn out in his rushes to be everywhere at once. But when Louis of Mala died, Philip was not in a rush. He knew that to properly demonstrate the splendor of the new Burgundian dynasty to the towns of Flanders, a solemn and elegant procession was necessary. The funeral procession was Philip's first public act as Count of Flanders. Louis of Mala died at Saint-Omer, but would be buried in Lille. The approximately 40-mile, or 65-kilometer, journey took a few days. It was led by Philip the Bold and Margaret of Flanders, of course, but also included many of the Knights of Flanders and magistrates from Louis's burgeoning civil administration. All told, the procession saw 500 of Flanders' leading nobles march to Lille, all dressed in the finest black cloth available, of course. It should be noted that this procession was a fundamentally noble affair. Representatives of the major towns attended the funeral, but the ceremony was catered to the aristocracy. As always with these aristocratic events, symbolism carried the day, and the number five dominated the proceedings. Philip was inheriting five counties from his father-in-law, Flanders, Burgundy, Artois, Nevers, and Rethel, and the banners of the five counties lined the hall. Five archbishops led the funeral mass, and they were assisted by five abbots. The next day, when Philip was officially invested with his inheritance, five Burgundian knights flanked him on one side, and five Flemish knights flanked him on the other. The ceremony was filled with pomp and circumstance. As I've mentioned previously, Philip was a lavish spender. He not only had expensive tastes, but he also saw that this grand presentation, or useful splendor, could wow his friends, subjects, and rivals. The funeral hall was illuminated with thousands of candles, and Margaret's mourning cloak was made of over 200 squirrels. After Philip was invested with his new counties and lordships, the splendor continued with a grand banquet. Once Philip was officially Count of Flanders, he went straight away to Brabant to visit his aunt-in-law Joan, the Duchess of Brabant. You might be saying, but Ghent is in rebellion still, and the last time Philip was in Flanders, it was at the head of an army. Why go to Brabant and not to Bruges or Ypres or another Flemish city? Well, that's a good question, and to answer that, we have to revisit Louis of Mala's war with Brabant. If you'll recall, Joan was married to the brother of the Holy Roman Emperor during that conflict, and in exchange for the help of the Emperor, she agreed to pass Brabant to her husband's family if the two died childless. But, you might also remember, that in her peace deal with Louis, she agreed to pass Brabant to Margaret of Flanders if she died childless. So what's the deal? Even though the Holy Roman Emperor had helped Joan regain control over her duchy, when he pulled out, Louis was still refusing to make peace. Flanders and Brabant were at an impasse. Joan could no longer call on the resources of the empire to come to her defense, 
and Louis was beginning to strain his financial resources to pay for the war because, and I'm sure you know this, wars are expensive. Therefore, the in-laws decided to make peace. Flanders was in a much stronger position here compared to Brabant, so Louis of Mala could more or less dictate terms. As established previously, he was able to strip the castleries of Antwerp and Mechelen from Brabant, and established Margaret's right to inherit the duchy. As Joan's husband's family kind of stopped helping out halfway through the war, Joan didn't see too much of an issue here. Additionally, when Joan first gained control of Brabant, one of the conditions that she agreed to during her joyous entries into the cities of the duchy was that if she died childless, that her sister's and not her husband's family would inherit it. So this peace deal does fit better into the agreement with the cities. But she also agreed that Brabant would not be divided, and here Louis just took two of its most prosperous towns, so maybe the joyous entries are not the eternal agreements that the cities want them to be. All this aside, I mainly wanted to establish that there were competing claims to succession in Brabant, and while Philip and Margaret had the best claim to Brabant, they did not have the only claim. Philip had spent the years leading up to his Flemish inheritance by sending ambassadors and secretaries to Brabant to strengthen his support in the duchy. Philip continued his use of fief rents, salaries paid to someone in exchange for their homage, in Brabant, and so made vassals out of many of the leading nobles and functionaries in the duchy. By the time that he became Count of Flanders, Philip was known and liked in Brabant, even if many of the citizens of the duchy did not care to be gobbled up by Flanders. So in Brussels, Philip met with both Joan and Albert of Bavaria, the regent and eventually Count of Haino, Holland, Zealand. As the House of Dampierre transitioned into the House of Burgundy, so did their mortal enemies, the House of Aven, transition into the House of Wittelsbach, Bavaria. Both of the successor houses no longer cared to carry on the blood feud that we explored in our first supplemental episode, Family Feud. And so the three heads of these low country realms decided to form an alliance. All three of these leaders knew that their independence and security could be assured by an alliance. Joan had been menaced and invaded by the Dukes of Helders over the past few years and was looking for allies in her fights against them. Albert and Philip were in slightly better positions, but both were faced with internal divisions. The Hook and Cod factions in Holland were in a low-grade war, and in Flanders, Ghent was still in rebellion, and, it should be noted, was being supported by a few of the more radical towns of Brabant and Zeeland. This alliance was agreed to in principle, but not officially enacted in 1384. Negotiations would continue, and the next year, a double wedding between Philip's oldest son John and Albert's daughter Margaret and Philip's oldest daughter, Margaret, and Albert's oldest son, William, would seal it. But we have a lot to go over before we get to the double wedding. Philip returned to Flanders from Brussels and immediately began his tour of his new county. He made joyous entries into Bruges, Ypres, and many of the other towns and cities of Flanders, but not Ghent. Ghent had not submitted to Philip at this point, but at least was not openly in revolt against him. A two-year truce between the count and the city had been in effect when Louis died, and Philip had every intention of keeping the peace. Philip also decided to begin his Flemish rule with an act of leniency. He issued pardons to all the towns of Flanders who had been in revolt, other than Ghent, in exchange for a monthly aid. The aid was not his only means of raising money, though. Philip continued his practice of raiding the French treasury and requested a gift of a hundred thousand francs upon his ascension to the county to help pay for him to take over his new territories. He also requested compensation in the form of a hundred and twenty thousand francs to cover his costs in pacifying Flanders. But in all fairness to Philip, he did put in a lot of effort to pacify and secure the county. He was sure to protect his new territories from both internal revolt and external, most likely English, invasion. A new round of castle building and repair was begun in Flanders, as well as his neighboring and newly acquired county of Artois, which, if you'll recall, was right next to the English-held Calais, so the money received from the central French government was at least well spent here. Unfortunately for Flanders' peace and security, an outbreak of fighting between the Count and Ghent would erupt not long after Philip came to power in the county. 
Here, one of his supporters, and a leading noble of Flanders, who had his lands raided by the Gentinars stationed in Audenarda, decided that enough was enough and took matters into his own hands. He managed to intercept a caravan of wagons heading for the town and fill them with his soldiers. In a kind of recreation of the final days of the Trojan War, these wagons made it to Audenarda, and once inside, the soldiers jumped out and opened the gates for the noble and his men so that they could take the town. Ghent viewed this act as a resumption of hostilities, and Philip was unable, or maybe just unwilling, to convince his vassal to return Audenarda to the Gentinars. So, before long, fighting was back on the table. However, due to Philip's soft touch in Flanders and his alliances in the Low Countries, Ghent was isolated. The towns of Flanders had no reason to rebel against Philip, and the new count was able to get his allies to help establish a blockade of Ghent and prevent their lands from sending supplies to the rebellious city. Therefore, the Gentinars once more turned to England for aid. The English king, Richard II, justified intervention by claiming that as the quote-unquote king of France and feudal overlord of Flanders, he had not yet received homage from the new count of Flanders and so did not recognize Philip in this role. And so, Richard sent a regent with a small army to Ghent in order to re-establish English control over the county. As this army was crossing into Flanders, Philip was in Cambrai with Albert of Bavaria and Joan of Brabant. Here, the three leaders finalized their alliance and began planning for the double wedding. One gets the impression that Philip wanted to use each of his children on a different alliance, and as Richard Vaughn put it, quote, intensely disliked the idea of using two stones to kill one bird. However, this was quite a bird and was well worth the two stones. I personally am under the impression that arranging this double wedding was actually the most important thing that Philip did during his time as Count of Flanders. Under his son John, the alliance sealed with the double wedding would pay dividends time and time again, and under his grandson Philip, it laid the ground for Burgundian domination of the Low Countries. The double wedding also served to exclude the English from Haino, Holland, Zealand, as they were trying to get William to marry an English princess. As the English were firm allies of Helders at the time, Joan must have let out a sigh of relief. When negotiations were starting to stall in Cambrai, it was Joan who greased the wheels. She pressured Albert away from an English alliance, and she pressured Philip to give John to Margaret of Bavaria. Two months later, the two couples were wed in Cambrai. The ceremony was yet another excuse for Philip to show off his lavish tastes. Philip used income from his lands and his royal connections to secure finery. Philip, John, and their knights were dressed in fine velvet suits, and the women of the Burgundian court were dressed in cloth of gold. The three principal Margarets of the ceremony, Philip's daughter, soon-to-be daughter-in-law, and wife, were all adorned with some of the crown jewels of France. The cathedral where the wedding took place was decorated with fine tapestries and the whole of Cambrai was turned into a high-end tourist town for all the high nobles in attendance. And this wedding was a who's who of French and low country nobility. The wedding mass was followed by a week of celebrations. Feasts and tournaments marked the occasion. Thousands of animals were slain and cooked. Cinnamon, sugar, oranges, dates, and other eastern delicacies were served. And of course, Barrels of Burgundian wine made sure that the event was well lubricated. Lavish gifts were given to allies and supporters of Burgundy to mark the occasion, and in fact account for about half of what Philip spent on the wedding. Speaking of finances, Albert is reported to have spent a year's worth of his revenues from Holland on the wedding, and Philip is said to have spent four times as much. The expense of the wedding may have driven Philip's maître de compte, or master of accounts, up a wall, but Philip was investing in the future here. He had won over a firm ally in the House of Wittelsbach, which would serve as an enthusiastic partner of Burgundian expansion in the Low Countries. He had also finally managed to secure the inheritance of Brabant from Joan with this double wedding. But alliances aside, the wedding was the perfect opportunity for Philip to display his wealth and influence to many of the most important nobles of Europe. Despite the fact that four people were getting married and Philip the Bold was none of them, he was the star of the show at Cambrai. His children were still, well, children, and Albert of Bavaria did not have the same command of opulence that Philip had. 
And so, in 1385, the Low Countries were more or less divided into two factions. There was the Burgundian-led alliance of Flanders, Brabant, and haino holland zeeland which was supported by France. And, in opposition, was an alliance between William Duke of Ulich, William Duke of Helders, and King Wenceslaus of Germany, Duke of Luxembourg, supported by the German Empire and England. Not that the Empire as an institution was really in the state to do anything at this point, but that's another story. Shortly after the double wedding, Philip once more went to the House of Bavaria looking for a marriage. This time it was with Albert's nephew Stephen. Philip arranged for his nephew, Charles VI, to marry Stephen's daughter, Isabeau of Bavaria. It was at the wedding between Charles and Isabeau that Philip received news that Ghent was once again on the offensive. While Philip was distracted by elegant weddings and high-stakes diplomacy, Ghent had been testing the waters. A few expeditions led to nothing, but in mid-July 1385, the Guntinars, still being led by Francis Ackerman, managed to capture the city of Dama and secure access to and control over the Zvin Inlet. Guntinar, and by extension English control of the Zvin, was frankly disastrous for both Philip and Charles. Dama's location meant that Ghent had essentially cut off Bruges' access to its port at Slouse. Additionally, an expedition to England was currently in the works, and the French had a fleet assembling at Slouse. With the Gentinars so close, the fleet was now under serious threat of sabotage. Therefore, another royal army was assembled to fight Ghent. The army, led by Philip and Charles, was supplemented by a significant bourgeois contingent and assembled at Dama, and put the town under siege. Unfortunately for Ackerman and the Gentinars, no English aid in the form of supplies or reinforcements appeared incoming. So, after about a month under siege, the Ghent garrison slipped out of the town. The length of the siege meant that the window of an easy channel crossing was closing quickly, and so the English expedition would be put off until 1386. Meanwhile, the French army chose to pillage the area around Ghent for their trouble. But Ghent's resilience was beginning to falter. The city stood alone in Flanders against the Count, and in their hour of need, no English aid appeared in Dama. Furthermore, winter was approaching yet again, and a combination of Philip's blockade of Ghent and the French soldiers pillaging the countryside meant that food and other supplies would be hard to come by. Philip, meanwhile, did not appear to be craving bloody retribution. He was, above all, a practical man, and now had seen three French armies come to Flanders and fail to force a peace on Ghent. Therefore, Philip and the king each sent letters to Ghent, offering a pardon and inviting the town to negotiate. In late 1385, representatives from Ghent sat down with Philip at Tournai and began negotiating. An agreement was reached shortly before the end of the year. Ghent would submit to Philip and renounce the English alliance. In exchange, Philip would pardon the people of Ghent and confirm the rights and privileges of the city. Additionally, Philip swore not to interfere with Ghent's trade privileges and would not force obedience to the Pope in Avignon onto anyone. And so peace finally returned to Flanders. Philip had been unable to crush rebellious Ghent and so had to come to terms. Ghent remained proud and sensitive to perceived slights to her privileges. This, of course, would cause friction between the town and the Burgundian dukes, always trying to grow their power at the expense of the towns. Another conflict between Ghent and the Valois was inevitable, but that was for another day and another duke. Finally, in January 1386, Philip made his joyous entry into Ghent. Now that Flanders was pacified, preparations for the English invasion could continue. But before we see the French fleet assembled at Slouse, let's catch up with the course of the Hundred Years' War. We've mentioned conflict between England and France a bit in the recent episodes, but the last time we really checked in with the pulse of the conflict was in 1380 with the deaths of Charles V and Bertrand du Guesclin. Since 1380, the conflict had cooled significantly. Richard II, the young English king, was not nearly as bellicose as his grandfather Edward III was, and, in general, both France and England were exhausted by war. Conflict was still common, but in smaller expeditions rather than large armies. Since 1381, the English and French were negotiating at Lollingham near Calais. These negotiations continued off and on over the decade and would occasionally be interrupted by some military action, such as Henry de Spencer's crusade into Flanders. 
Philip was intimately involved with the negotiations, but he was also still taking the lead with the war effort. His simultaneous goals of making peace and war might seem contradictory at first, but you have to look at his dual Franco-Flemish role. His ultimate goal, of course, was peace. Peace was needed to keep the wool flowing from England to Flanders and to protect Flemish shipping in the North Sea and English Channel. As regent of France, peace was needed to protect the country from further devastation and chevouches, but the price of peace could not be ruinous to the kingdom. Therefore, after years of negotiations came to nothing, Philip decided to go big with an invasion of England. A successful invasion of England could end the war on extremely favorable terms, and even an invasion that didn't accomplish much could still spook the English and make them more willing to consider peace. Just as lack of military success pushed Philip to negotiate with Ghent, lack of diplomatic success now pushed Philip towards a military operation with England. Preparations began in early 1385. Perhaps Philip was further motivated by Richard's refusal to recognize him as Count of Flanders and England's continued aid to Ghent. These preparations were interrupted when Ghent gained control of the Zwin estuary, but after peace was finally made with Ghent, they could continue. The summer of 1386 saw Slaus consumed with activity. Flour was ground and turned into biscuits, ships were assembled, and a giant wooden fort. Actually, that doesn't quite do it justice. A small wooden city was constructed in pieces to be set up on the English coast. The shipyards of Normandy had been working since the 1370s to construct this fleet, and the whole of the northeast coast of France was crammed with soldiers ready to set off. By the end of the summer, over 1,200 ships had gathered and were filled with provisions. All the great lords of France were ordered to bring their own supplies, and Philip gathered over a thousand animals, hundreds of pounds of cheese, and 500 barrels of wine for his own entourage. The sail of Philip's flagship was painted with his motto, Il Metade, I cannot wait. As September turned to October, the time to depart was approaching, and Philip would not have to wait much longer. England had not been blind to the developments at Slaus and had been making preparations of their own. Some of London's suburbs were demolished to create a more defensible perimeter, and military units and lookouts were stationed all along the coasts across from France. But in the end, all the preparations on both sides were for naught, possibly due to bad weather and possibly due to his own hostility towards the invasion plan. Philip's brother, John, the Duke of Berry, was late to Slaus. Just like the seizure of Dama last year, this delay caused the window of an easy sail across the English Channel to close. Once again, the English expedition was postponed another year. However, this time negotiations would be more successful. While the winter of 1386-1387 did not see a treaty agreed to, it did see enough progress made that Philip decided that an invasion of England would now do more harm than good. Meanwhile, Philip was distracted by matters further east. Helders was once again making trouble for Brabant. As I stated earlier, the Low Countries were roughly divided between Flanders, Brabant, and Haino Holland Zealand on one side, and Luxembourg and Helders Ulich on the other. If you recall, Joan's husband was the Duke of Luxembourg, but he died in 1383, and so Luxembourg went to his nephew Wenceslaus. Wenceslaus was also the son of the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles IV, and so was also King of Bohemia and King of Germany. This meant that Wenceslaus had a lot of resources that he could draw on to expand his power in the Low Countries, but also that he generally had more important things to do on the other side of his realm. Now let's get introduced to Helders and Eulich. Duke William had inherited Helders from his mother in 1377, and his father, another Duke William, ruled Eulich. The father and son got along quite well and repeatedly went on campaigns together. So while Helders and Eulich were not held in a personal union at the moment, they were still quite close. In the mid-1380s, both Luxembourg and Helders Eulich wanted something from Brabant. Wenceslaus wanted to inherit the duchy as was agreed to way back in the 1350s when his father, the Holy Roman Emperor, came to Joan's rescue, and the younger William wanted some land that Brabant held as an enclave in Helders. But when Wenceslaus got distracted by other affairs, William of Helders alone went to war with Joan of Brabant. When Philip heard of this, he sent a small force of Flemish knights to aid Joan and enlisted the help of Albert of Bavaria to negotiate a truce. This truce would not last long, however, and all the while William was also negotiating with England, 
he ended up drawing a handsome salary from the English and agreed to declare war with France. So in 1387, William resumed his war with Joan. Philip continued to give aid to his aunt-in-law, but as always, with Philip, it came at a price. Joan ended up giving Philip sovereign rights over her territory of Limburg in exchange for his aid. As the war got going again, William made a crucial mistake. He insulted a teenager. He sent letters to both Philip and Charles VI that were riddled with insults. In the letters, he refers to Charles as the, quote, so-called King of France, and Richard II as, quote, King of England and France. As Charles VI was a young man full of hormones and, spoiler alert, was not the most mentally stable king that France would ever have, this letter riled him up fiercely, and soon the young king was preparing for war. Philip, for his part, was ecstatic that he once again had the opportunity to use the French army to secure an inheritance, and was hoping to pull off another Rusebeka. He had actually been pitching an expedition to Helders for a while now, but had faced pushback from the rest of the royal court due to the small strategic value that such an expedition would yield. Additionally, France had other things to worry about, such as the much closer English ally, the Duke of Brittany. But Philip got his way in the end. A truce and a pardon for the Duke of Brittany was arranged, and soon French attention turned east. Philip even managed to convince Charles to march through the Ardennes Forest in Luxembourg in order to spare Brabant the pressure of supporting yet another army, something that William's ally, the Duke of Luxembourg, didn't try to fight one bit. So in 1388, the French army took a roundabout route to Helders. William was an able military commander and a skilled tactician, so when a massive French army reached him, he did the wise thing and came to terms. He pretended that the insulting letter was sent on his behalf by the English and not by him, and he begged Charles for forgiveness. The terms of the peace were fairly good for Helders, reflecting the fact that despite having a large and imposing army, the French were unable to take any of Helders' key forts, and the Helderian army refused to meet them in open battle. So, after all that, nothing really changed. The French army then trekked back through the Ardennes forest to France. It was a cold, rainy, and miserable march. The campaign may have come to nothing for the French, but it was a rousing success, both for Joan and for Philip. The expedition convinced William to focus on other things in the near future, such as a campaign with the Teutonic Knights, and thus Brabant was free from Helderian arms for the next decade or so. Philip benefited from this campaign even more than Joan, who was able to once again claim a huge sum of money from the French treasury for his expenses, quote, in the army that the king has assembled for Germany. He was also able to extract more money from Joan, and when she couldn't pay, he magnanimously accepted more of Brabant's territory instead. Philip's strong arming of his aunt would continue throughout the next decade, and bit by bit he would extend Burgundian influence into Brabant. However, the Helders' campaign proved to be somewhat of a poison pill for Philip's influence in the French court. Philip had pushed for the campaign over the objections of many of the other members of Charles's inner circle. And now that the campaign had yielded no great victories or plunder, everyone else involved was a little bit disappointed. As Jonathan Sumption put it, quote, The immediate consequence of the debacle in Germany was a palace revolution at the French court. The professional administrators had always chafed at the personal power of the Duke of Burgundy. The Helder's campaign brought them new and powerful allies. It had been Philip of Burgundy's venture, conceived in his personal interest and pressed on the French king's council against the judgment of many of its more experienced members. The choice of route had been Philip's too. So had the decision to negotiate with the dukes of Eulich and Helders, instead of wasting their dominions with fire and sword, which undoubtedly served the dukes' political interests in the Low Countries, but deprived the captains of the army of the loot on which they had counted. Above all, the inglorious outcome of the campaign had proved an intense disappointment to the king, who soon came to resent the pressure that his uncle had brought to bear upon him earlier in the year. Charles VI, now almost 20 years old, had decided that he was done being led around by his uncles. In November 1388, a week after returning from Helders, the Cardinal of Laon, in front of the whole royal court, suggested that it was time for Charles to take the reins of power for himself. All throughout the hall, courtiers, clergy, and army officers nodded and murmured with approval. Charles then thanked Philip and John for their service and dismissed them.
Of course, for a monarch who had been led around his whole life, it is unlikely that he came to this conclusion himself. The king's younger brother, Louis, the future Duke of Orléans, a smooth operator with ambitions no less than those of Philip, despite being only 16 at the time, was likely involved here, as were the Marmosets, a name given by the chronicler Foissat to a collection of advisors of Charles V and VI. It is likely that the mastermind behind this decision was Olivier de Clisson, the constable of France. And so Philip and John had to say goodbye to their days of running the show. More importantly, they had to say goodbye to plundering the French treasury, and now had to watch jealously as Louis of Orléans stuck his own hand in the kitty. But things were not all bad for Philip. He was still an indispensable man, and his rule of Flanders and diplomatic talents meant that he would remain at the center of the peace negotiations with England. Moreover, he was firmly in control of his inherited territories and was the preeminent landholder in France, and he was still first peer of the realm. For the next few episodes, we're going to take a break from the narrative and go over some other aspects of Burgundy. Next episode, we'll take a quick look at Philip's administration and how he governed his territories. After that, we'll take a quick tour through the lands themselves to get a better idea of what actually made up the Burgundian polity. And after that, we're going to look into art, culture, and the Burgundian court. Then, in episode 14, we'll return to the narrative and take a look at what Philip was doing when not in the center of French politics. Thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, I would really appreciate it if you would rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice and tell your friends about it. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me on twitter.com slash Burgundy or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website at granddukesofthewest.com.